Hi everybody, this is Jeremiah, and in this video we're going to talk about the basics of game playing. Up to this point, we've looked at a lot of different well-defined problems. Among those, we've also briefly touched on the idea of multiplayer games. One of the issues with all of the search approaches we've looked at up to this point is that they cannot make a prediction of what our opponent might do. As a result, they're only good for doing a search up to the point where we depend on someone else to make a decision. Game playing is a set of techniques that allow us to make predictions about what opponents or other agents might do in the game world. Multiplayer games come in two main variants, what we call symmetric games, in which all the players have the same abilities, and asymmetric games, where the players can have different abilities. We can also classify most of these games as either real-time games or turn-based games. Some examples of symmetric games that are real-time include Doom and the original Warcraft. All players have the same abilities in the same circumstances. Some turn-based examples of symmetric games include Go, Settlers of Catan, Poker, Magic, and the original Civilization. In all of these games, the players start out with the same basic abilities. Some examples of asymmetric games that are real-time include StarCraft, where players have different abilities depending on the race that they've chosen, GoldenEye, where different characters have different heights, and I think we all know someone who's played as Odd Job, and Street Fighter II, where all of the players have different special abilities. Some turn-based games in the asymmetric realm include the original Final Fantasy, where the different classes have different abilities, and Civilization III, where the different civilizations have tweaks and modifications to the basic foundations. Games that are well-suited for game playing tend to be well-defined problems. As a quick review, a well-defined problem has a few key features. It has an initial state, a starting point for the game. In chess, this is the starting board configuration. It also has a set of one or more goal states. These would be checkmate or stalemate board configurations. It has a set of reachable states, which are all of the board configurations we can reach through some valid sequence of moves between me and my opponent. And it has one, usually more than one, operators, which are ways that we can change the state of the game by taking action. In a game of chess, this is moves. And in a card game, this might be playing a card. Because these types of games tend to be well-defined problems, we can tackle them with search-based techniques. In order to use these turn-based approaches, we're going to need a few key pieces of data identified. The first is we need some representation of the game state. This will include configuration of any board, any pieces on the board, their locations, any cards in play, any cards in players' hands, players in the game, as well as the player whose turn it currently is. We'll also need representations of moves or actions that can be taken in the game. In a game of chess, this might be as simple as the originating and destination locations for a piece. In a card game, it might be some data representation of a card that's going to be played. We also need a terminal function that will tell us when the game is over, and an evaluation function that will tell us who has won the game when that game has ended. In addition, we often overload the evaluation function so that it will perform a heuristic evaluation if the game has not yet ended. That is, it will come up with an estimate of who seems to be winning and by how much if the game isn't over yet. It's important to remember that this is just a cursory glance at the game state. It's just a heuristic evaluation. It's not a deep predictive estimate, but a shallow one that glances briefly at the game state and makes a quick evaluation. The first game playing approach we're going to take a look at is referred to as the greedy method. The greedy method goes through all of the possible moves and makes an estimate, a cursory evaluation of how good each of those moves is before returning what it considers to be the best one. Coming into our algorithm, we will need game state information. In practice, we often split off the player whose turn it currently is from the rest of the game state. But technically speaking, these are all part of the game state. This is really just done for convenience to make our algorithm a little bit easier to write and understand. Throughout our algorithm, we're going to need to keep track of the best move we've seen up to this point. Since we haven't seen any moves yet, we'll start this out as a null reference, but eventually we'll want to fill this in with a valid move. We're also going to create a working game state that we can make changes to. This way we don't have to make changes to the original game state. If you think about it, this is how we operate in real life as well. If you're playing a game of chess or checkers, it's usually considered impolite and often illegal to move pieces on the board while you're trying to figure out what you're going to do. Instead, we make a mental copy 
of that game in our head. We make the moves on the mental copy in our head, and when we're done, we make a move on the actual game board. And we're going to take the same approach here. Once we've set up our data stores, the next step is to come up with a set of valid moves, and for each one of those valid moves, we're going to do the following. First, we're going to make a fresh copy of the incoming game state onto our working game state. We'll then apply the move and make a heuristic evaluation of the resulting game state. This will help us determine, according to some heuristic, how good the resulting game state is. Whatever the value of that game state that results from the move, we will say the move also has that rank or that value. The better the rank, the better the move. Once we've evaluated how good the move is, if this is the first move we've seen, then it is by definition the best move we have seen up to this point. Otherwise, we'll want to check this new move against the previously determined best move so far. If it's the first move we've seen, or if it's better than the previous best move, we will reassign the best move marker to be equal to this move. We'll repeat this process for all of the possible moves, and we will return the one that we found that seems to be the best. There are some very real benefits to using the greedy method. It's fast, it uses very little memory, and it uses very little time. However, it also has some very serious drawbacks. Among them, it completely ignores the opponent's reaction. Because it has no predictive ability, this AI will fall for almost any trap we set, because by definition, a trap looks good until you see the result. In addition, because it has no long-term strategy in mind guiding its moves, it tends to be very short-sighted. Now that doesn't mean you can never use the greedy method in a game-playing scenario. If you have a novice or beginner player, it's usually not a very good idea to put them up against the hardest AI you have. This is a case where the greedy method works very effectively. At first, as the player is still learning the rules and basic strategies, the greedy AI will best the player. However, over time, the player will learn to set traps, and this is an AI that will fall for all of those traps, reinforcing strategic approaches by the player. Eventually, the player will master the greedy AI and can move on to a more difficult one. If we want to move beyond this greedy approach to game playing, we have to consider the idea of rationality, which is the degree to which agents use reason when making their decisions. This will allow us to use predictive approaches to make a best guess about what our opponent might do. There are many variations on rational agents, and we're going to look at one particular model known as a perfectly rational agent. These agents assume that their opponents are perfectly rational, and they will use those assumptions to make predictions about the opponent's behavior. Using those predictions and any other information that they have, they will make a reasoned decision. The Minimax method is one approach to predictive game playing based on the perfectly rational agent model. You may also hear this referred to as alpha beta trees or game trees in the industry. In Minimax, we will have our computer player and we will also have a simulated version of the opponent. Our AI will be trying to maximize its position in the game, so we'll call it max, and our simulated opponent will be trying to minimize that AI's position in the game, and so we will call it min. Now it's important to remember that this is just a simulation of our opponent. It is not the actual opponent. This is the image of the opponent within the algorithm of our AI. Let's consider a simplified version of checkers. Our AI will control the black pieces, and our opponent will control the white pieces. Each player will make one move, and the game will be over. We'll also assume that there are no kings, so players can only move in one direction. Our AI, Max, has a couple of options for his moves. One of them is that he could move A up and to the right. If he does, his opponent will then have an opportunity to make a move. That means that Min, the simulation of our opponent, will have two possible options. He could move D down and to the right, which will result in a board that looks like this. Now, since each player has made one move, the game is over and we must do an evaluation of the board. We will consider black pieces to be worth positive one and white pieces to be worth negative one. If we do this and we perform the evaluation, we will get a net of zero, signifying a tie. On the other hand, if min moves D down to the left, we'll get a different board state. If we perform the same evaluation, this time we'll get a result of one, plus one, plus one, minus one. If our opponent is smart, and we're assuming that the opponent is, that opponent will select the move that minimizes 
our position in the game. In this case, that's zero, which indicates a tie, rather than one, which would indicate a win for our AI. As a result, we can assume that if our AI moves A up and to the right, that will result in a tie. So we copy that value up and associate it with that move. If Max moves A up and to the left, that will give Min a few more choices. Our opponent can move C down and to the right, which will also result in a tie. Min could move C down and to the left, a tie again. The opponent could move D down and to the right, resulting in negative one, which is a loss for our AI. Or the simulation could elect to move D down and to the left, which would also result in a tie. Given all of these choices, we would assume that our opponent would select the move that will minimize our AI's position in the game, which would be the negative one, which would result in a loss for our AI. So assuming that our opponent is a smart opponent, if we move A up and to the left, that will result in a loss for our AI. So now Max, our AI, must choose between 0, negative 1, negative 1, and 0. That is, tie, loss, loss, tie. Because we want our AI to select the best possible move, we would select one of the tie values. By convention, and for optimization purposes, we usually select the first option that we come across. So in this case, we would move A up and to the right. You may be wondering if this could result in predictable AI. And it most certainly could. For that reason, in practice, after we have finalized the algorithm, we usually randomize the order that we go through the moves in. This allows us to select the first move without being too predictable. If we take a look at the Minimax algorithm, what we're going to see is that it is remarkably similar to the greedy approach. In fact, we can start from the greedy code and just add a few lines. The first change is that we are only going to do an evaluation of the game state if we have reached the end of the game. Otherwise, we will make a prediction about what the opponent is going to do and grab that rank. In this particular example, we are assuming a symmetric game, but if you have an asymmetric game, the results may be different. In a symmetric game, because all players have the same abilities, we can use the same algorithm to make a prediction of what our opponent is going to do as we use to select our own move. So we merely need to change the player whose turn it is and recursively call the minimax algorithm in order to make a determination about what our opponent is going to do. Technically speaking, Minimax finds the best solution, assuming a perfect opponent, by making predictions all the way to the end of the game. However, Minimax is not without its problems. First of all, unlike the greedy method, we must be able to determine the player order in order to make predictions about opponents in Minimax. This is usually fairly straightforward, but there are cases when it is not. It's also going to use recursion all the way to the end of the game, which is not really practical in most cases. To give you an example, in the 90s, there was a research project to map out all possible moves to the end of the game in checkers, and this took many years to complete. There's also a lot of unnecessary branching in Minimax. Later, we're going to learn that there are ways that we can mathematically prove that some of the branches will never yield our solution, and as a result, we are expanding them when we don't need to. There's also no random capacity built into the vanilla variant of Minimax. We don't have a way to deal with dice, cards, or other random elements or events. Fortunately, there are some ways that we can mitigate, if not completely eliminate, some of these problems. We can introduce player order logic in most games to determine who the next players would be. We can add a depth limit check to prevent our AI from searching for too long. And we can implement a technique known as alpha-beta pruning to prune off unnecessary branches. To deal with random capacity, there's also the concept of chance nodes that we're going to look at next time. Implementing player order logic in most games is fairly straightforward. You simply change the representation of the current player within the game state. One interesting example that we can look at is when one player must forfeit his or her moves if he is unable to make a valid move. This is the case, for example, in Reversi, also known as Othello. In this two-player example, if our game state has any valid moves for the next player, we will return the next player, represented by negative player. However, if that player does not have any valid moves, we will return the current player again so that our current player gets to make another move because the opponent has forfeit his move for lacking valid actions. A depth limit check is also fairly straightforward. We can use a counting up or counting down approach. This requires a minor modification to our terminal check 
where we check to see if we have reached the depth limit. If we have, we will use a heuristic evaluation rather than making a recursive call. We must also modify our function signature to add a depth to each call. It's important to note that the depth limit check will yield us results more quickly, but it also comes at the sacrifice of making more accurate predictions further into the future.